indeed. Um, I want to move on to the lovely topic of consciousness. Um, we've had many folks on the show who strongly believe that computationalism is false, which is to say that you know it, it, it can't it can't be created in silico. And I just wondered how you thought you know progress in theoretical neuroscience can shape our understanding of the nature of consciousness or, or, or qualia. But do you think that consciousness could be created artificially? Yep. Go on. <laughs> do I have to? <laughs> Please. I have been known to refer to this as the C word. Um, yeah. So consciousness is uh, yeah, it's definitely a fraught topic. Um, I I don't understand the failure of imagination that for some reason silicon and electrical currents can't realize a function that can be realized in you know electrochemical systems that are more carbon based i i i just i don't understand the intuition why why there has to be something so special about uh, one particular implementation and so uh, if we take consciousness to be something which is essentially functional which I think we have every reason to believe it is. You know, not every carbon-based life form is conscious. Uh, if you think it is, then we have a whole other bunch of things to talk about. Um, but if we don't think they all are, right, then I don't see any reason to think that they can on only they can be, right? Uh, and so I, I, exactly how people come down on the horns of that dilemma is really interesting. You know, so people like John Searle just embrace it and like, yep, yeah, if it's not biological stuff, it can't possibly have understanding and can't be conscious. But from my perspective, you know, I just don't understand at all how to convince myself of that. There, there seems to be no empirical fact I can appeal to. And I can appeal to lots of other empirical facts that suggest many of the interesting functions that we see in biological systems can be replicated in non-biological systems. So right now, I think the preponderance of evidence is in favor of being able to have consciousness in non-biologically based physical substrates. Yeah, it, it's such a difficult topic to discuss because uh, Sel was talking about understanding in lieu yeah, of he kind phenomenal. Yeah, all that stuff together, though. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head whether it, whether he would say that consciousness couldn't exist in in silico. It, it's more the sense that John Searle in the room didn't understand Chinese without the phenomenal experience or, or whatever. But um, yeah, it's it's really interesting because the problem with consciousness is there's no there's no consciousness meter, right? We can measure function dynamics and behavior, but consciousness is is kind of like in in the ether, so to, so to speak. I mean, I just wondered if if could you kind of formalize what you think it is and and how it emerges? Um, right, sure. If I had to guess, uh, essentially, I think it is a complex dynamical system. Um, self-monitoring right so i think we have and there's, there's all kinds of evidence that different parts of the brain are sensitive to what other parts of the brain are doing are sensitive to errors that we make in speaking or motor control um you know uh our um we have a lot of hierarchical structure in the way that our biological system is put together and so something like you know a sufficiently deep hierarchical controller i think is what's going on when we start having that system able to report about its own states, right? So it's really it's really an issue of just how the information is flowing through the system. Um, and so when you're down at the level of bugs, where you've got these ganglia that are controlling the legs pretty much independently from the brain, um, which is about the same, has the same number of neurons as each of the controllers in the legs, then there's just nothing there to be doing this kind of monitoring. And so there's no conscious experience. There's no what it's like. There's nothing, right? There's nothing looking at the neural activity in the right kind of way. Um, but as we move to mammalian brains, then, you know, in all of these kinds of brains, we find very sophisticated sort of self-monitoring uh, in some sort of way, which eventually allows us to report like people do. Yeah. I mean, Char Chalmers famously argued, um, I guess he's a property dualist and that it's, a str you know, the only strongly emergent phenomenon in the universe. So not directly deducible from any truths in the low level domain and all of that stuff. But, yeah. but you know, I couldn't help but get the feeling with Chalmers that you're left thinking, especially with his philosophical zombies argument that what's the point? You know, what what purpose does consciousness solve if it's completely separate yeah. to all the other parts of the system? I mean, what purpose do you think it solves? Oh, so why would you want to self-monitor? <laughs> There's a million reasons, right? So this a massive improvement in robustness, right? Uh, 
So your ability to identify errors before the environment tells you is <laughs> sort of severely punishing you, uh, or even interlocutors. So have, you know, being in a social group where catching your own social errors before somebody else does can be critical. Um, you know, giving you sort of levels of um, sophistication in uh, predicting uh, the, the you know future states based on past states. I mean, all these things are going to be dependent on your ability to integrate information across many different systems. And that integration is the kind of thing that, you know, sort of, I think, concurrently happens with the uh, the monitoring stuff. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I understand that. But I think you're, you're still talking about the dynamics, which is like the microscopic behavior. And you get so I, I mean, I, I can I can go along with what you're saying. I, I think I, it seems plausible to me that you have those dynamics and then you have this macroscopic weird thing called consciousness emerge. But but that thing doesn't seem to be doing anything. But what do you mean? So it, it's doing things in the sense that so. So I will admittedly struggle with the notion that there is something which is consciousness, which is independent from uh, the brain or something like, you know, when people So I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Dan, it's quining qualia. Right. But oh, I think I'm, so. I'm a, yeah. a reasonable believer in this idea that, sure, we can make up properties which you know, are non introspective, introspectable or measurable or what have you, but we're just making the properties up at that point. Like we don't have any reason to think that they are real existing things and we can talk about them. We can fool ourselves through the way that we structure language into reifying them, making them seem as real as other things, which actually are. But yeah, things like, you know, the, what it is like independent of the person having the experience of what it is like, like it was what, like I, I just, <laughs> these, these are, you know, these are just conceptually problematic from my, my perspective. So yeah, I, I will always think about conscious experience as being uh, something being had by a system, by a physical system, right? And I don't think we have any evidence to the contrary, <laughs> as far as I'm aware. Yes, I mean, I must agree. I mean, in, intuitively, I, 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 I am a physicalist and it does sound like an affront on physicalism. I mean, Chalmers is a materialist. I don't, he, he, he has a way of arguing that, that it still is. But um, let's bring in, in embodiment so um you know this is really really interesting right that there's there's this concept of um embodied consciousness and i just wondered like to what extent do you think that um embodiment is is a you know a required uh, component of consciousness oh that's a tricky one so um I mean, I could you, ha could you have a disembodied counts? consciousness i guess that's what i was going to ask like, yeah. what counts as yeah. disembodied consciousness right so is it somebody, you know, like floating above themselves on the operating table. Is that disembodied <laughs> consciousness? Because um, my suspicion is that it, in some ways it is, in some ways it isn't, right? So it's embodied consciousness in the sense that the person having the conscious experience has a body, um, but it's sort of disembodied in the sense that they feel like they are observing something uh, from a perspective which you can't have from within the body. But, you know, people are, are reasonably good at actually taking on perspectives that they aren't experiencing in the moment. So... But does that count as disembodied? I mean, I don't know. And they, they, maybe the more important thing is, like, I don't think you would have the kinds of conscious experience that we do with no body. But again, I'm just speculating about some untestable, untestable uh, state of the world, right? So yeah. our, our bodies play a significant role in determining the kinds of conscious experience that we have. That seems reasonable. Okay, but we are traveling at 100 miles an hour into, you know, this mind-body problem, you know, going back to to Descartes and it's all about the the relationship between mental states and physical states so what do you think that relationship is exactly I mean for example I can I can dream and I can imagine lots of things in, in my mind most of those are deducible from things I've experienced and you could argue some of them are not but what's what's that relationship I mean the things we call mental states are physical states right that's that's my that's the relationship <laughs> I don't I don't think it's too complicated. The mind is the brain or the mind is in the brain the mind. This actually this I think this is always a little bit funny. What kinds of words people pick to to say what the mind brain relation is. But yeah, you know, ultimately, they're one in the same. And uh, we can take different perspectives on the same physical system, giving rise to, you know, different ways of describing those physical systems. So when we talk about mental states, uh, I think we're often averaging over or, you know, picking out a variety of or clumping together a variety of brain states, right? Um, which is, 
fine. It's a very reasonable thing. We do we do it for all kinds of physical systems all the time. Um, and it's interesting in the case of the mental and the physical is that you you can't step outside of the mental, right? So you you know you can't imagine some other system which is interacting. You know, like one example is lightning, right? So you know, is lightning um, identical to the ionic charges that are flowing through the the atmosphere? So I, I would say yes. Yeah, I, I think they're identical. Um, and then somebody says, "Well, just a minute. You can't you can't like measure that flash or you, without consciousness, right? Well, you can't. You, you're relying on your mental state to make that physicalist identity claim." And the, the answer is, "Well, yeah. I guess you know you are. I can't I can't make any claims where I completely get outside of my own uh, you know uh, subjective experience. So uh, it just gets more and more murky when we're trying to talk about." things like that physicalist identity in the case of lightning, but now we're talking about the mental states themselves, which we also can't get outside of. So <laughs> I think it gets it gets hard to think about, but I don't think it's inconsistent, right? I think you can definitely hold this view and uh, like I feel like I do, and it makes perfect sense. And can I prove it to you? No. Can you prove the opposite to me? No. And that's that's where my patience with philosophy gets thin. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I, I love I love this concept of subjective experience. It seems quite important. And um, I, I just wonder whether you could define it, because presumably you think an agent has an internal representation and, and that is its subjective experience. And there's some kind of asymmetry between its representation and I what can be. On the web. Sorry, that's Siri. There's some um, asymmetry between its representation and what can be conveyed to other agents. Yes, I, I will say that. I mean, I would be. I would not identify uh, my internal representations with experience. I think we have internal mental representations which we don't experience, but we don't know about. Right? Your subjective subjectivity it has limits into what it can have access to, um, um, and that's part of the reason why I agree with the second part of your statement, which is that we can typically only partially describe our internal representations to others. Right? Um, and taking that perspective and trying to communicate it is always going to be limited, right? Because we don't have perfect yeah. access to all of our internal representations in a way that yes. we can, yeah. Yes, and, and that, that asymmetry seems to be the core point that even So was talking about, that there's always a richer representation inside than which can be conveyed outside. But um, I, please forgive me um, the indulgence, but I, I would love to get your take on free will and, and agency. I mean, even with, with agency, what makes us an agent and... Do we actually get to choose our own actions? Are we are we autonomous? Practically, yes. Go and on. I think that's I think that's also <laughs> all that matters. To me, this is like the infinity question, right? So okay. um, you know, and, and it may be in, in a surprisingly direct way. So I think people are chaotic dynamical systems. Chaotic dynamical mm. systems are not practically predictable, right? So and it, uh, assuming infinite precision, of course. Um and so I think when it comes to the question of free will, are we determined, like, are we, are we deterministic or not? Well, chaotic dynamical systems are deterministic and unpredictable. And so you're one of those at worst. And maybe, maybe you have actual free will, whatever that, but it doesn't matter. It's, in, it's indistinguishable from the perspective of any social structure, any legal system, you know, any desire to hold people responsible for actions and all that kind of thing. So, so ultimately that, you know, makes the question of free will one, which is, uh, I'll say, as interesting as <laughs> some of these questions about consciousness, which to me just means unanswerable, hence uninteresting. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. And, and even then, there, there, there's a scale dependence. But even at the human scale, we're sufficiently chaotic that you would argue that, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to predict. OK. I mean, just before we move off philosophy, do you think there are any like important philosophical questions that theoretical neuroscience can help us answer? Yeah, many. I mean, this is, uh, you know, so literally my, my trajectory <laughs> has been do an engineering degree, go get a PhD in philosophy of mind, and then do theoretical neuroscience. And the theoretical neuroscience is literally in my PhD thesis. And I think that uh, more of that can happen. And in, in that instance, you know, I was looking at questions of what are mental representations? Can we give stories? What is misrepresentation, mental misrepresentation? How do you map neural states? So uh, onto psychological states. So, you know, I, I 
use this term neurosemantics in place of something like psychosemantics, which is trying to be you know much more clear about exactly the kinds of questions you were just asking me about. Um, and yeah, I do think that this um, interaction can continue. So we can learn things about how to talk about particular philosophical questions about representation and uh, and knowledge and understanding and so on um, in in the context of what are our best theories of understanding how brains function. You know, what what mathematical properties do we have or not have? Which ones are important? Which ones aren't? Is it does it matter to take into account finite resource constraints? Um, if we think in terms of continuous versus discrete states, is that going to change how we answer questions about knowledge and certainty and all these kinds of things? And I, I think the answer is generally yes. You know, these can have uh, lots of impact. That these being the answers to the theoretical neuroscience questions can have lots of impact in the way that we would address a wide variety of philosophical questions. Absolutely.